start off by saying, hey, we're back with one more episode of Speciality Talks. It's been a while since we caught up. Uh, Speciality Talks is a series of conversations with operators, entrepreneurs, experts, building technology, you know, solutions and platforms. And as part of Speciality, we invest in early stage deep technology solutions, right? In enterprise software, SaaS, deep technology, hardware, etc. We are partners with many such founders who are building amazing solutions, right? Uh, as part of this series, today we are talking about something very, very current, right? Not many conversations can happen today without the mention of Gen AI or data around it. So we are definitely uh, excited about today's conversation of how Gen AI and data interplay today in today's world, correct? And for today's conversation, we're very happy to welcome Akash Tandon and Satya, two founders building amazing companies, right? Full disclaimer, both of them in our portfolio that we are doubly excited about, right? Quick two minutes about Akash. Akash has been a data infrastructure guy and building products for companies like Social Corps, Atlan. He's also written a book on data intelligence, uh, business intelligence using Python. Uh, in Python, etc. So he will have a lot of insights on that. He's currently co-founder at Loop Panel, that is trying to make the life of user researchers much easier, which a bunch of AI and uh, associated techniques. So we'll get to hear from him as well. Akash, thanks for joining us and thanks for and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks a lot, Arjun. Always a pleasure. Right, uh, our other speaker is Satya. Who's being a serial entrepreneur, right, uh, is on to his third startup, I think, right now, right? Uh, and he's built and sold a startup in the data infrastructure space to Apple, no less, right? So there are some learnings there and his long and illustrious career in data infrastructure. He's once again building a strong platform called Blue Copa, right? At the heart of it is unique data infrastructure solutions, this time for applications in the financial uh, domain for finance teams and strategic finance teams in companies, right? So his experiences from the past and how the entire landscape has evolved will be very, very valuable. Satya, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Arjun. Hey, hey Akash. All right, so I'll hand over to both of you for a little background of your view on how this whole data landscape leading up to how data feeds into generative AI, how you define it at a very basic level, right? And just set that context in, based on your own experiences, correct? Of how these two things have evolved and how they've come together now today. And that sort of will be a good base to get started with. So if each of you can give your viewpoint on that, we'll start with that. Akash, we go with you. Okay. Um, sure. So to start off, I'll just quickly add that I had started off with the whole AI uh, sort of domain back in 2012, which was a very exciting time because that was around the time when the whole deep learning revolution began. Uh, and then a few years on, got sucked into the data ecosystem, partially uh, fascinated by the fact that even back then doing like small scale machine learning by today's, uh, you know, standards was a big hassle because cleaning data in spreadsheets wasn't any fun, um, right? Uh, same as what people are trying to do with much larger data sets today. So, but one thing that I've realized over the whole course in the last, uh, you know, almost a decade at this point at different sort of levels of understanding is that there's always been this divide uh, between people trying to necessarily extract value from data um, and the whole data ecosystem and the whole data stack that got built. Um, and right now uh, the whole AI revolution kind of happened on, in parallel, uh, which, necessarily wasn't ideal, but uh, just the people who were always interested in those two problems were different uh, for different reasons. Uh, and a lot of times uh, 
you know, this among other reasons was one of the reasons why a lot of, you know, AI and data initiatives, um, it was a long running gag that most AI initiatives saw this fail. Uh, but recently uh, what has happened, uh, and I think this is becoming more important, especially because I think people realize now that to really build great data science or AI solutions, you need to have your basics uh, around data hygiene and data sanity in place. So I think increasingly people have realized that, uh, you know, just the value of having good sort of data infrastructure in place, and especially uh, that with the whole LLM and Gen AI, um, um, the whole uh, open source or closed source APIs, you know, whatever you use for leveraging Gen AI these days, uh, people are increasingly realizing that the more you are apt with your data, the more you have your data systems in place, the more sort of hygiene you are uh, you have in place when it comes to your data systems, the better it is. Um, so increasingly these two worlds are kind of converging at least they're acknowledging each other a lot more than they did work, you know, uh, over the last few years. Uh, now, I mean, that's a high level sort of understanding that I have right now. Obviously, we can dive deeper into the nitty gritty but that's... No, sure, very helpful with that context. Satya, your, your views on, you know, what has evolved, what you've seen, and what is, you know, this whole convergence that Akash is talking about, do you see the same, how do you see it? Right. So even like we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll talk in even more broader strokes than Akash did, right? So why have we arrived at the place we have arrived now? You know, what has led to uh, us being, us getting here is primarily the ability for companies like, large companies like Google, they've uh, kind of uh, discovered slash hack their way into handling large amounts of data. That's, you know, that's become necessary as a part of their business model, right? That's one part. Then simultaneously, uh, somebody thought that neural networks, which, you know, I, I think they're, they're, they're from 60s or 70s, right? You know, they, though, those could have another, uh, a fresh breath of life uh, with the large amounts of data that you have and you know again because of the large amount of data that google or you know all the larger companies had to deal with and the the, the fact that cloud came in and you know we had the infrastructure now and the compute infrastructure to deal with it right that that adds into the fact that now we are able to big make big neural networks right and then um, the combination of big neural networks added with this data handling together is now you know is is the reason where we are you know why you know today right is because two or three things came together and that's that is why this new llm this new generative ai paradigm has come through right it's not uh, it could not have come any earlier right it uh, it came when it could come right because everything came together at just the right time no, that's a very interesting way to you know articulate that and design that i think large data came first right maybe possibly right because of internet Business mobile data, interest, yeah, yeah. right and then you needed computer, computer right. right 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 so that followed right the neural networks were there as a concept and were being used but without uh, these two things, right, yeah. fed to the neural network, large yeah. data sets and compute available, you couldn't come up with today's Gen AI capability. Very interesting way of because the classic le classical learning, uh, you know, it didn't actually require, so to say, big data or uh, large amounts of data, right? You could you could learn things in the classical way with maybe a hundred thousand records. You know? to top it to understand the patterns right? and therefore you didn't need compute either you could right. do with cpus and not you didn't need gpus correct so that's that's the reason why you know um, llm came now not before very interesting that is a good point i think one of the things that was discovered which 
I think led to this and which for a long time was a bone of contention as the community was the whole point around whether it's compute that's important or the algorithms. And then at some point, someone tried to push it. We know the company which did. Uh, and they basically discovered that scaling laws are a thing. And I think that's a very good point. That's a very, uh, so the whole sort of revolution at sort of scale and data kind of has its backbone. So it makes sense. It's very clear. So it's not the chicken or the egg. We, we clearly know it's the data which came first and everything else followed, right? So Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. Uh, so then in this new world, right, where large models are being trained with really large data sets, right, with infrastructure, how should we think about, I think Akash touched upon this data hygiene, data quality, pipelines, just talk about therefore readiness, right? Uh, these infrastructure platforms also have come into place in the last few years, like you said, because data explosion has happened, right? We've all seen the you know, amazing force of companies such as Snowflake and many others, what they have enabled, of course, in conjunction with cloud, right? But what are, according to you, the biggest challenges in handling data today? You, either of you, yeah. So you can go first this time. Okay. Um, what are the big challenges? So again, you know, I'd like to set some more context. You know, expect this from me. You know, because I perfect do the context setting first. So, what is that generative AI or like you know? what are we looking at and if we understand that first then we would be able to understand what challenges we are going to face potentially right if we look at in broad strokes the major uh, if you will turing award uh, level papers right are the transformers thing the attention is all you need paper right and then you know separately the alpha go alpha model stuff right which is you know which involves self play to gather more data and to understand and then you know improve on the play right so broadly when people speak about artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence so to say they talk about two things one is agency right which is the thing has a task and it knows um, how to achieve the task. It has policy, so to say, right? And then what they call as um, uh, the compression of knowledge, if you will, right? Uh, now, the better way to understand it is look at a kid, right? As she grows up and what is she learning? What is the data which is being fed? And how does it approximate to what uh, uh, what what artificial intelligence can do for us, right? Uh, we all know that artificial this these LLMs today, right? They are being graded on several tests, SATs, uh, uh, GMATs, etc. So why is it that they are doing that? How does that reflect? And you know what is that? How does that reflect intelligence in the first place, right? It's like it's just as if you would, how would you understand whether you want to take a person in your company, right? Or into your organization for, uh, or into your educational institution for more specialized knowledge. First, you would want them to um, do well on knowledge, aptitude, et cetera, you know, certain certain levels of stuff. And that is why these, these large language models are actually being graded on those tests, right? <clears throat> Now, what is the data that was fed to these uh, large language models today? If you see, it is similar to what humans have been fed, which is that uh, a ba babies hear their parents talk and you know people outside talk. They make pattern matching machines in their, inside their head, small pattern matching machines, and they start understanding language, right? And slowly uh, they get world experience which is in terms of sensors, et cetera, right? They continuously, all data, visual, oral, everything is going in, right? And they start 
gathering knowledge you know i think one of the first things uh, so you know i've i've my kid is 7 years old so i have a fairly recent experience of teaching my kid so if it, when when a you know kid one of the first things you show is like you show him a blackboard and say it's blackboard show him a tree it's it's a tree right and so on and so forth so they they acquire knowledge with language right language is a very vocabulary is a very critical part of uh, gathering knowledge because that compounds over a period of time right so what we are doing first is we are feeding data into an llm which is just generally language uh, labeled stuff which teaches it concepts right and just like a human is able to read a book and compress the knowledge right and summarize it the llm the artificial neural network is actually able to summarize it so elia satswekar right which is the who is the one of the founders of uh, open ai he thinks that basically what a neural network is doing is compressing the large amount of data to something that is usable and what do we mean by usable that's where the second part of the data which comes in which is what they call as reinforce reinforcement learning right in this in the particular case of uh, open ai it was reinforcement learning with human feedback like a um a, a kid if after a little while you ask them about a concept they don't know they start making up things right which is very similar to the way uh, these llms hallucinate they start making up things right and when do they stop making up things when they know more or when there is a pushback from the outside world uh, saying that they are not allowed to make up things right so th this is another kind of data which is fed which is a meta knowledge about um, what what do what does a society or what do a society of humans think about how you display or how you um, present your knowledge so that's the second level of data now after this is a third level where you have a generalist uh, knowledge jibble agent so to say right and what do we do with these generalist knowledge agents in the in the real world uh, like if you take a person you know if if after they've done their 10th or 12th where they've got this generalist knowledge they then teach them specifically about let's say uh, medicine or law or you know any 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 specialized area in particular right and specialist areas need data but in a summary form is what i would like to argue right but you know that's that's why i'm setting this context that the third level is where we are i mean because uh, at the lower level the foundational uh, we are assuming that the foundational models are going to be there right? that's not our job that is you know some large companies who are doing it or the open source which is going to do it and get us to a stage where the foundational models are going to be available and on top of it we are going to build specialist systems right and that is where we need this this data and what kind of data is that and uh, is the thing that we can talk about further sorry i've taken too much time i think uh, no no very helpful context is always and i will pick up on that for akash to kind of you know you know either you know my question there was therefore what is the nature of data needed yeah. for the training for the preparation what what uh, criteria has to be there uh, i think uh, satya also mentioned the labeling aspect obviously it is one of the aspects that data preparation is is in the steps of data preparation right so if you can throw light on some or all of those and and or add on certain things that satya was saying that will be great so sure. uh, yeah so satya i think very nicely described the whole process that we see uh, one of the big companies who have sort of millions of dollars to spend can uh, you know do to spin up their own sort of foundation models as he pointed out and which other companies will work on so now um, i'll try to build upon what he already said so i mean uh, it goes out to the classic sort of problems that we all have sort of while running companies uh, how much do we do in house how much sort of we outsource what do we build versus buy 
so a lot. So we will most probably at this point, as it seems, is uh, which is a sentiment that's echoed by I think a lot of people in the AI ecosystem who are deeply embedded, is that uh, there will not be a one sort of model to rule it all, but there will be sort of a lot of specialized models in place, uh, and which means a lot of companies I think will broadly face two problems and challenges, and then we can sort of go deeper if you want. One obviously will be the part around infrastructure and sort of their own data. So yes, you will have open source models available. Uh, you will have APIs available. Uh, but then again, uh, either they, they can be very expensive or at times it, they can be very, they may not cater to your particular use case very well, right? So in those cases, you either have the option to, you know, do as much as you can from scratch or sort of train your own model or you can try to fine tune sort of an you know, off the shelf model or you can go out and try to sort of do a lot of things which uh, right now a lot of teams are doing which is you know be smart about using the models that are already there and try to find a balance between sort of the optimal result and sort of cost and sort of convenience uh, so there will be two problems, as I said there. One will be just, I think, and I sort of used to say this a lot even when I was purely in the data infrastructure ecosystem working there, I think a lot of projects fail because of talent. I think that's still a big problem. Uh, understanding sort of, you know, what you need to do uh, because yes, you can do a lot of things, but when to do what to do, I think that is a bit fuzzy compared to even typical engineering or product problems. So there, a lot of understanding will need to be bred in with how, what, what all can be done with these new class of models and what you can do. And I think the more, that is a bit tactical and more like a human resource problem, but, and the more, uh, I think, what can I say? Uh, yeah, the more implementation oriented problems that around will be around, you know, deciding, let's say, let's, I go with the point. Like you said, you you decide. Okay, none of the models work. Uh, now what do I do? So you can either say that I train a model, or you can say I will pick up a model and try to sort of uh, make it as good as I can. And in that case, the next question will be, uh, okay, so let's say if you have the person to do it, is the data that you have enough? Can you even use the data? Like, are you sort of under legal, legal obligation to not use the data? And I know this particularly because these kind of questions I've been hearing for the last five years, right? Uh, so there'll be, and again, uh, so infrastructure around sort of inputting that data, a lot of old data engineering problems, which I think, uh, you know, existed around sort of working with old school analytics or even models, a lot of them will still exist, uh, just wrapped up in a new flavor because uh, you still need your data around sort of, how, you know, how the data is sort of formatted, how the data, uh, you know, can be uh, segmented, what data you can use versus not use, all that will still need to be sort of sorted as you, uh, use this new class of models, uh, even if you get past the talent problem, which I do think is a big issue. So, Interesting. So you're you're basically, and help me or correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically saying this is not the magic pill yet, right? For that, a lot of people think it can be for so many companies who are looking to sort of really use AI for business benefit, correct? And what you are saying is the large publicly available models, correct? Either paid for like open AI or open source free as the case might be, are still not contextual enough for let's say my small business, my medium business, my enterprise. So therefore it's not directly relevant to useful immediately. It'll give you some answers, but it'll not really <clears throat> answer most of it. Is that is that the direction, is that a fair, Summary of what you said. Yeah, I think the shine will wear off 
that's what i think uh, so even for example yesterday or i think couple of weeks back snowflake and databricks the two big companies in the data ecosystem had their conferences and they both released some version of their own models or sort of unstructured query engines and things like that uh, yeah and one of them of course acquired yeah you know so with, uh, with, uh, you know with with those model capabilities i guess yes so i think uh, i think increasingly ux and proprietary sort of this data will become more important and data not just in the sense that you will train using it but even a lot of i think uh, what people are doing even like designing their own prompts or pipelines uh, or you know a lot of that will rely on internal sort of knowledge and ip especially as you move away from general use cases especially niche use cases i think there will be a second wave uh right so now companies should start will need to start thinking about how their own proprietary data is being set up available accessible to therefore hopefully build specialized company level models would right. that be the best way of extracting value out of this whole wave Oh, is that is that a question for me? Yeah, yeah, Akash, you only okay. first. Then uh, Satya also if he has an answer. Basically, specialized models. What we are saying is the large existing models not easily accessible, or accessible but not directly add value. Then it's yeah. Then the option is specialized models. I'm saying not necessarily specialized model as much as even if it's a layer that you build on top of it, which sort of you works with the same model. i'm saying it will take more than just plugging in an external model right. to make it work it may not be a new model it may be a new layer that you build on top of it some smart data processing something like that got it satya any thoughts on this part the specialized yeah. model versus the generic model of out there and how you see this playing out and yeah so one um, one thing that i find very helpful each time i try to understand uh, or try and answer a question is to look at these foundational models as sort of talent you know one of the things that akash was mentioning was um you know most projects fail because of lack of talent right so i would look at it as let's say fresh talent right so out of the box out of right out of school right that's why they are doing gmat so it's fresh talent now the two three levels at which these specialized models can operate right just with the continuing with the analogy uh, a person comes into your organization she is taught uh, about the processes of the organization and she is given a particular work to do prompt to do right and because she has agency and because now she needs what they call as knowledge or grounding right which is she might read books which are specific to let's say if it is supply chain management right she might read books which are specific to supply chain management or she might have read that in business school right so now that is one level of specialization that might be available with the foundational model or not Right, that that depends, right? And secondly, yeah, the foundation model might start adding hey, a finance layer, a retail layer, I don't know, a, you know, I don't know, a big deal, yeah. something, right? An engineering layer, so on and so forth. Right. So this second level, if you just continue with the analogy, is your business secrets. Company level, maybe. Company level, maybe. Right, company level stuff, which is your own. way your own specialized knowledge so whatever they call as proprietary is typically you know you can you can equate it to business secret sure real ip sure. So that that's that's where the data is very important or the ip is very important it is almost at a ip level stuff right that you give exposure to this model right how sure. do you do that the multiple ways at the moment we are doing it using a vector database and you know taking that and feeding it into a prompt and giving it to a llm right now 
what is the hygiene required for all of this? It's not very different from any of the classical machine learning stuff that we did, right? Which is like, you need data hygiene at a very bare minimum. You need to be, you need to present it. So if a human can understand it, so can an LLM, right? You, you put a table with facts and say that when this happens, this is what, this is a domain, this is a co-domain, you know, this is the input and output. So just as a human can see it and process it, the LLM can see it and process it. Sure. Right. With a, a generalist, as much as a generalist can understand your business secret and why, what is sure, If you put it out there, like that, this is the strategy of this company. This, this is, is the company. tactic of this company. This is the philosophy of this company. This is right. the approach of this company. Right. So on and so forth. So all of those, like Akash pointed out, can be built as layers. They can be built as policy layers. They can be built as strategy layers. They can be built as vector databases, which have which ground the model in using further knowledge, etc. So all of these can be built as. Those layers. are not necessarily compute intensive, data intensive, or they can be. How uh, do you? No, how I don't. I I don't personally feel they are very compute intensive, right? If you do want like if you see OpenAI recently, they have said that okay. GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4, they're going to allow fine tuning going forward. And uh, which means that there is a queue there, which means that there are certain aspects of knowledge uh, which, which might require fine tuning, which will be compute intensive. So that is more important for people who have collected a large amount of data. I think that is where those, those use cases are coming from. Cool. Right? They might not be relevant for um, a company which is done, doing some manufacturing of, uh, yeah. let's say, even rockets. Right? Yeah, they're a little more horizontal in some sense, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And those massive sets of data yeah. enable more horizontal learning right. Right. or more generic learning, which then can be dissipated largely seemingly as APIs or as utilities Absolutely. through which you make, you know, small dollars per transaction, but you make billions of transactions. Right. So it, it's equal to the Blue, Bloomberg GPT thing that we were talking about, that, uh, the, that Bloomberg released, right? Which is, it, it just fed it a lot of amount of news and stock market data and uh, how a human would interpret that. And, you know, that's, that's kind of fine tuning the generalist data, the generalist model to what, so all the Bloomberg started with doing their own transformer, if I'm not wrong, but I think those are the use cases for which OpenAI is trying to uh, allow fine tuning of GPT-4. You know their their agenda, their strategy is also changing. Their tactics are also changing as the world is evolving. This is a very nascent field for sure, right? But what we are trying to understand is how is the landscape going to be uh, ahead, right? And at least for three four years, what is your readiness as a business, and what should you think about it, right? It's that's that's that is what we are uh, discussing. Right? Interesting. Interesting. It, it, I, as I see it, there is definitely going to be a replacement of some talent, right? Like Ash, you know, hit the nail on the head when he said that most projects fail because of lack of talent. There's a uh, ta decent talent is uh, what that will get replaced by AI in the immediate future, in, in the immediate future. Immediate being like on a five-year horizon. But not very specialized talent. Not very specialized. Need not be very specialized. Some generic talent will have that. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Maybe just to pick up on a little thing that you said, and we spoke about, you know, the large models built by the Bloombergs of the world, of course, and the fundamental models, of course, built by OpenAI. Facebook has something open source. Google has, right? <clears throat> Any thoughts on just these big boys? Can there be any other big boys? Is there opportunity for, you know, any outsiders to come into this play, or is is that has that ship sailed? We're just prognosticating here, right? It's, it's it seems like so many, particularly from our industry, right, which is you know billions of dollars are being pumped into these opportunities and these ideas, right? Has that big ship sailed on the LLM big? large LLMs, correct? Is that going to be just around these half a dozen players, right? And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. You guys are in the trenches, use these things, know people in these places and have been thinking about this forever, right. correct? 
is that done can there be any break in this is there can still small companies still aspire to create some meaningful dent on this large what i crudely call it that's a utility now or that should become a utility just like aws infrastructure you know azure infrastructure google cloud so on and so forth right, right? but what's your view on this correct because that seems like the data moat that they have crawled the internet or or their own data sources whatever that seems like data moat so i'm going towards the data as a moat sure. right. question but maybe with this hook so curious to know your thoughts here so for foundational models definitely you need uh, large amounts of data but you need large amounts of curated data right uh, so these curated data sets there are now open source data sets as well as um, com- you know companies have built their own data sets you know there is uh, open ai uh, i believe has a lot of people a lot of contractors who curate this data for them right there are companies which are around curating data the company is built around that right that is one area where you, should, you might want to focus on uh, you know it might be geography specific segment specific or whatever those particular data and as we discussed right uh, data sets around um, medicine data sets around uh, uh, molecules you know pharma whatever it is right big industries so big domains that have domain. that and that might each industry and domain might have large data requirements right. and if somebody can sort of ring fence that and capture that and build around that that might still be moats correct correct which probably the big boys are still doing so there is an opportunity correct. they have not yet already done it right so the way i see this evolving is there will be open source models which are much more generic let's say 10th class right then somebody takes it and makes it pass some other exam right so that's that's how i'm looking at it right so um, there is also the other thing is there is this graph of so there are techniques like lora q lora quantization everything that is happening in the llm space itself which is making the models come down in size in terms of compute requirements so that is one graph which is happening simultaneously what is happening is the cost of these gpus um this specialized hardware for training that is also going to come up right Correct. that is also going to drop right Correct. at which point all these billions of dollars which are going in now may yeah they were just for a first mover advantage right so that's that's a first mover advantage but um is it like seriously a first mover advantage there is no um the two ways to think about it right open ai has lots of users what is it doing with that human feedback correct and right. that is that critical enough for the lead for the long haul right. if you take anthropic if you take pi.ai um, these are the guys new boys in the town right new newer boys in the town right so they are believing in reinforcement learning without human feedback that's the natural reinforcement learning. see reinforcement learning is the game is a final game right human feedback happens to be just the appetizer right so this this i mean the you should be able to just using data you, you you could incorporate the human feedback in the data itself you know that's a very crude high level way of putting it and uh that's yeah basically there is scope for newer guys because of these cost dynamics you know working differently interesting right? akash yeah i think i'll add one thing to it so one way to think about it obviously is okay can you sort of talk these guys make better foundational models uh but i think especially for s- someone like opene and i think anthropic or even the way s- someone like stability works on this which is the folks behind stable diffusion they are kind of research first in some sense and then they have this whole sort of enterprise or customer layer uh and which is where i think even the google paper which transformers which satya said sort of stem for so there'll always be research happening um and as long as sort of there's active research happening i think there's an opportunity here uh, for someone to come in because uh, yes like the cost uh, the, there's a barrier which is right now one big barrier happened around sort of the cost it takes 
uh, but as like for example let's say tomorrow uh, one thing which i know for a fact couple of sort of interesting directions that this space is taking is one around agents and stuff which is which basically goes even one step beyond sort of llms and or even generative ai which is basically saying that hey can you have agents which drives things and i'm like no one really sort of knows if that will work right now but just help just for context for the audience also what are agents yeah okay you know how do you define agents what do they do in addition to this how do they build on this sure uh, so i agents and the other thing by the way just i was going to was modality which is right now basic uh, people are also trying to get to models which work across multiple domains which even open ai is also trying to work in um so okay uh, which is probably the most straightforward of the two uh, to sort of think about but agents is something and this is something uh, that is being talked about because of two reasons one uh, there were some open source projects which really took off and there's been a lot of interest in that uh, but agents generally is the concept that these llms can be made to sort of you can stitch them together in a way uh and sort of have them work with external systems in a way that they can not just be one off uh, sort of systems that you interact with but they become kind of basically they truly become yeah, in the sense that you give them a task and they figure things out which is not which hasn't got into the point that i mean production but from couple of people and sort of being uh, uh, and sort of generally sort of from one contact works at open ai i heard like this is something that's been seriously sort of thought about uh, so which also their latest release a lot of it was around working with apis which partially sort of stems from the interest in this aspect so there'll always be i think as long as there's new research coming out someone needs to sort of get it to users and i don't think a lot of these companies who are doing it well necessarily uh have the bandwidth or even the intent to take them i don't know if microsoft feels differently uh but th- there'll always be i think an opportunity maybe just not the exact one which maybe open ai cracked or anthropic is trying to go after yeah i think the way things are changing and how it is also being consumed by both customers users directly and by b2b enterprises that will therefore shape the narrative of where are the bigger opportunities but that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense that there will be newer opportunities emerge at different layers right i think the agent part for actionability makes sense i i kind of believe that agents are going to be built by the saas companies right the saas companies is it today is asking you just looking at this them, them as last mile applications correct they are the last mile um, stuff and it's like they are a direct replacement to either a person or a department in your organization so agents you know will group together uh, with a problem statement which will give it the agency and the knowledge which is there in the system together to find out an answer for a question or solve a problem right mm. that is where the direct replacement of talent will is is bound to happen and whoever starts it first you know open ai with chat ml has opened up functions which is that um, given what if if you expose the functions which are available in your system to open ai when a person is having a chat with um, chat gpt uh, if it realizes that they are asking a specific question which involves calling a particular function in your system it will do that automatically for you right so it's it's like basically so there are these early very early frameworks um, microsoft has semantic kernel i think langchain is one of the very popular ones right so there are these things which are being used to build um, these are frameworks for building agents so to say right so and um, there are agents like gpt engineer which write files etc there are certain functionalities which are available in it readily so these are going to be direct replacements for talent using these frameworks or technologies people are going to get replaced you know it's it's sad i don't want to uh, say it any other way right it, it's just that 
it's not a question of if it is a question of when yeah i think time horizons uh, because a lot has still to be built right? right to make this a reality in context for industries for companies at large scale right, right. It, it directionally that's that, that seems very plausible time horizon might be Correct. you know and, and uh, it, it is almost like you know this this prompt engineering stuff that people put which is that if one company comes up with the right prompt and the right combination of the sequence of things the right orchestration of things and then replicating it is not very difficult everybody will replicate it yeah and we've seen that in history also we've Sorry? seen that in history in various technical technological innovations we've seen that in you know, somebody was talking about this you know i guess the prompt is another way first of all it was let's say the search box right is a prompt which hey, has now been stuck with us for uh, 25 years i guess uh, then there was i think the scroll correct information scroll or news feed or combination of those right which is a combination of mobile plus a news feed correct right. coming in before that there were you know just general icons in html and gui so you're saying this prompt part which today is sort of everybody is thinking about chat gpt correct at least from the consumer side right you everybody we all think chat gpt right a box where you ask a question and it right. uh, it throws an answer it need not just be that way right so chat gpt is an interface level thing right it is as much correct. as an iphone app right as you can yeah. just historical equivalent is iphone app one person comes up with an iphone app everybody will come up with an iphone app correct it, it is not a moat it's not a it's not a differentiator yeah it's just an earliest form of it has taken yeah it's a parity feature it might help you with a first mover advantage but that's about it it's not it's not going to be a moat interesting this integration with chat gpt whatever you want to do it right um uh see natural i the way the analogy i would give it is the search box is that if you are speaking with a person who doesn't understand your language or you don't understand their language right there might be certain common things that you both understand door 15 rupees right so the way you speak in broken phrases with a person who doesn't understand your language like you call him sir door close right so these are the things that you say we are we've been talking to search engines that way right now we are able to like just generally have a conversation that that is not going to drastically we're looking for keywords today Right. right that 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 will uh, there will be a delta improvement in terms of how systems will be able to help us right uh, not a exponential increase over what a search box can help you with got it because it's the same person on the other end who's doing that retrieval of information for you got it got Broken it cases, so a lot but... of this is on the you know as the application or the consumption and the delta there right i want to go back a little bit to akash and say hey on the data infrastructure stack right there has been snowflake there has been data bricks there have been improvements on those right are those good enough ready enough for this whatever is this next wave that infrastructure and how they hand that they enable data to be handled prepared and presented to whoever is the consumer in this case models training models or agents or anything else right or what what are challenges there on the infrastructure side that the last few years have been good but the next few years you'll have to build new tool sets uh, on top of these or new ones will emerge what do you see or what do you sense is possible there or is even required then more importantly yeah uh, first thing i think because uh, we already talked about the convergence so maybe it won't just be the data bricks and snowflakes of the world will be building this uh, the data stack or the data tools required i think that's already changing uh, so like someone like langchain is can or someone like open ai to some extent is eating into the so model guys will be the infrastructure is what you're saying yeah i mean that is also you understand the need better yeah that is one 
way to think about it. But I think uh, another is that, okay, so for example, vector databases is one of the things that I've exploded recently, but the reason for that is it basically, other than, you know, theoretically or from a from the research paper point of view, nothing, there was never a need for anything like that. Right. Uh, we were not using sort of text data the way we are now. Or and similarly, uh, there'll be other pieces of input. Me personally, I'm most excited or just in general uh, excited about the fact that there'll be new kinds of data which no one really has a clue how to work with. Right. Uh, so I mean, we talked about like compute not being a problem. I think there was I think there was some part where sort of that happened. Like even let's say you're not it not being compute intensive, but I think one thing that so a lot of these snowflake data fix data stack of the world is geared to working with tabular data, right? And billions of rows is huge, for, like there or trillions of rows. Now compare that with text or images or video, right? Uh, that can blow up much much faster. Uh, so even sort of handling. As, and especially like right now we are sort of dealing with text, which is still like a small part, right? Once we sort of start adding other sort of modalities, et cetera, that those kind of systems just don't exist. So that is for me the blackest of blank spaces, uh, which vector is like databases is one part of it. Rest, I think whatever problems exist for people in the data ecosystem that will continue to exist. Um, and I think that. Uh, that stack around sort of data warehouse or databases or data lakes never really was able to seamlessly fit with the whole deep learning thing that was going on. Uh, but with LLMs, what has become easier is now you don't have to worry about running GPUs into your infrastructure or making sure sort of everything works sort of properly to run a deep learning model. You have a simpler interface, which is what also Satya pointed, like a lot of simpler interfaces available. So I think the old problems will remain there, um, like especially if you're working with tabular data, the, the place where they both fit together, uh, the interface between the two systems, which is the old school sort of, the old data sort of infrastructure and these new elements, that's where opportunities will really lie, which is like the databases is one example. Um, and for rest, I think, and that is not something necessarily that people who haven't worked with the, these kind of data systems know. So I think there will be an opportunity at that interface in particular. Uh, that is I mean, one sort of pretty big space. Interesting. So on the particular roles on the modern data stack that you know, of people who build that, operate that, manage that, data engineers, data scientists, similar side, right? You see there, therefore, there should be sort of an evolution of the roles of these tags, at least that we use. What a data engineer does, what an ML engineer does, what a data scientist does. I know they're already a little fuzzy, but yeah. <laughs> as will some of it become obsolete and it'll just go in a whole different direction. Again, uh, freewheeling here. Yeah, um, I think Sadda can also add to it, but I'll take a first step. Um, so I think these roles have always been kind of fuzzy, but I think data scientist in general has been the fuzziest of the lot. Uh, but I think what prompt engineers today do is I would say to some extent, a version of data scientist or data analyst uh, from that old world, uh, because what they're trying to do is make sure that you have this model or sort of system, and you basically are trying to come up with a way to uh, make sure that you get the best use out of it for your own data. But again, it's a very loose analogy. Um, but I think ML engineers in particular, I think that engineering role I think will be the least susceptible to change because there a lot of the challenges do remain same uh, especially if you are trying to do things in-house whether it's building a data layer or even training your own model uh, I think the infrastructure challenges or things like that will remain I think upskilling will be required a lot of it uh, if depending on how complex your tasks are 
I think the place where there will be, I think, a bigger uh, challenge for, I think, especially people who are, uh, for, I mean, uh, we have been using the term talent, will be uh, the more business facing roles because now a lot of data scientists and analysts, uh, they are at the intersection, uh, you know, where the business, the pure business user does not have the ability to tweak the systems which are, you know, expo which can sort of do their job or sort of make best use of the data, right? And there's been more this whole sort of uh, intent to make sure that the sort of the system and the ability to tweak it is very close to the business user that is there. Uh, and with the whole LLM sort of revolution coming in, I think the interface not becoming sort of much easier, there is a chance that there'll be some rules at least which sit at the intersection of business and technology will have a hard time, which was already happening to be honest. Uh, it's kind of a continuation there. But I think on the more technical side, I think there'll be more challenges to solve, etc. On the business side, there will be some restructuring. Um, maybe like, for example, a finance person will be more easily able to do, sort of use their data. Uh, earlier, they relied on two different yeah, teams. Not Q. <laughs> oh, I just exactly realized right. that. <laughs> right. So uh, he, he, here's uh, okay, a... But <laughs> I couldn't resist. Right. So it's a, it's a top down way of looking at this, right? Which is like, you want an agent which is going to replace your talent, right? Uh, which means that you need grounding, so to say, or knowledge about your own processes, your own data in the organization, which is which becomes a information retrieval problem. Okay, this is the data infrastructure part of it. What will get added to the data infrastructure part of it? So the uh, the piece that will get added is because if it is an information retrieval problem, the Originally, we were having search and database queries as two things which helped in information retrieval, right? These two things uh, will stay with the addendum that because you want textual data, uh, which used to be just basic search, now it is going to be vector search, right? And also other uh, other modes of data, right? The, though vector is just uh, a representation which will help you find text or videos or images or all the multimodal content that you want. Vector is a unification model for retrieving it. So vector databases will come in, right? Or hybrid vector slash, uh, you know, regular uh, search engines will come in and then there will be databases. These two will act as information retrieval systems. So only one part is going to get replaced in the not replaced, added to the infrastructure, if you will, right? Which were which was there earlier. The rest of the pieces stay the same, right? Now, on top of this, we are seeing companies which are coming in, which uh, act in the metadata layer, in the governance layer, etc. Right? So those pieces combined with the information retrieval systems together will help companies to use. Um, these generative AI models to replace talent, right? So th that is how I'm looking at it. Now, what that that segues into what roles which will will be available, right? Uh, what roles will be available? I think uh, I will take a. Uh, I, I agree with Akash that uh, it's the roles which are in intersection of business and uh, technology that are going to have a little bit of a threat, specifically data engineers, data scientists, or what have you, right? Those roles uh, are going to get replaced. They, they actually do get replaced when SaaS apps or software gets in, you know, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's one level of it, right? So it's, it's like, if you just very broadly think about it, Mark Anderson said software is eating the world, right? And now it is like software is going to eat software, which is like, it, it just keeps on going. That cycle keeps on going, right? So it's like who builds that software? Maybe software build, builds that software. So it's ultimately all of this is going to get eaten. The first line of threat is for people uh, who try to translate data into insights, right? 
and that's a very broad term on purpose i've used which is like it is bi it is data science it it is all of those things right those are the layers which which may get replaced first right because doing that right. strategy it is it is strategy it is yeah, yeah you can use uh, many many vague terms for it uh, fair enough no very helpful i'm going to take a pause this has been amazing free wheeling but danush i think there might be some questions from uh, uh, others that we have that list of questions okay is there any techniques or approach to improve the outcomes of the models maybe that's the something you want to your thoughts on that yeah quality of models quality of output of models and how do you benchmark right. these models when you want to implement application how do you shortlist because that's a, a a larger question everyone is trying to figure out but but is there any tips and tricks how you guys are shortlisting it will be an interesting question to uh, have so i think um, so to start off uh, if we keep the i mean in some cases let's say open ai does not Uh, satisfy only requirements or compliance or what not or security. I mean, keeping all that aside, uh, I think the first thing ideally anyone should do is sort of do a POC using one of those infrastructure sort of hosted models because it's just a big hassle. Otherwise, uh, it's it's not easy to even sort of host and sort of deploy and all that um, necessarily. If you especially if you don't have sort of prior experience, uh, but generally there are benchmarks out there. For a lot of these models, but I think there's a bit of art involved to it as well because for different use cases, because a lot of those benchmarks are based out of research in terms of question answering or a lot of tasks which were used for a long time for NLP research. Uh, so you and to so and again, uh, I think for most of those uh, uh, like leaderboards or benchmarks. Uh, Uh, you will have sort of the open air and then tropic and these on top uh, the open source model still lag but still i think uh, if sort of security is and cost like are factors in that case you may want to sort of use those benchmarks and try to pick a smaller model uh, and try to see uh, like for yourself like there's some subjectivity in terms of evaluating the results just working with it uh see if sort of it satisfies your use case uh, there are sort of some frameworks like openai has the framework called eval which again is not trivial to sort of work with but again uh, you can use something like that but i think to keep it simple you ideally you should start with somewhere where you don't have the worry of infrastructure or there are some providers which also sort of let you test different models uh, uh and sort of start there and then like to work your way towards smaller or open source models uh, based on those benchmarks if you want if you have a specific task you can look that up uh, that's how i at least i think about it so here's uh, my take on it is um, it depends on the application that you want it for if you're trying to do a saas app you could split it up as um again uh, information retrieval which is unstructured data some data su- summarizing it or etc any model is good enough for that right any model which does you know there are these evaluations that you have readily available you can see that uh, you know check just type a few questions and along with the information in within context without using even a vector database and check the if the result is up to your Uh, satisfaction uh, and you could use that so just to say that right, the very few people who are using llms in production at the moment right llm combined with something in production that that that's something you should know it's always it's going to be beta for a long time for everyone okay right? so the quality of output when we say if it is information retrieval uh, i mean in terms of data querying etc uh, you could start with open ai or one of those models uh, put a put a proxy layer collect your data and then if you want you can fine tune a open source model 
right? There are companies which allow you to run even open source model uh, as, uh, you know, they, they provide the infrastructure for running these open source models easily and fine tuning them relatively easily rather than doing it yourself, so to say, right? Uh, that is something you can do. So those are the two uh, things we have tried so far. Um, from uh, from all the people I know and uh, all, the, all the network I have, so far I don't know many people who've done LLMs in production, which is that without a beta. Why do you say, just a quick uh, this thing on that, why do you say that will be in beta for a long time? You, you said that. Why do right. you think that is the case? What's, right. what's holding this back? Right. It, it, it is the quality, like, you know, I think the question was asked about improving the quality of output, right? That's the same thing. Hallucinations, approx accuracy, is that, is that the, is that, is that a proxy for quality or anything else? Uh, no, so I, I don't think accuracy is one, one, accuracy can be gained by grounding it, right? Uh, which is like, you give the information in context as to what it has to answer about, and it will give an answer, which is mostly okay. Right. Otherwise, there is a chain of thoughts thing. There is like if you and there is research to be done by trying to use alpha mo model of Markov chain process tree in this, etc. And all of that. But that research is still to be made. Uh, but accuracy is OK. You 95 percent accuracy, which is as, as much as a human can give you looking at data. Right. So I don't think that is uh, one thing is it will it will stay in beta because nobody would want to stamp that this is accurate accurate answer or um, human is always in the loop, so to say. The, it, it cannot happen without a human in the loop for some time. That is why we would call it beta. You know, we can take the beta label off when we say human is not need, needed in the loop. So I'll give you an example, right? Jasper AI will give um, stuff for a marketer, right? But it need not be necessarily very useful for them as it is. They might need to work and rework and rework on it. The human needs to prompt it so many times. That's when it becomes, you know, usable. So it's, it's so, so to say, that's why I'm putting the beta tag. It's a very generic, uh, you know, label. So. And just following yeah. that, uh, Akash and Satya, it would be great. Uh, what is your Genai tech stack look like? And what are you, what are the models you are experimenting with? Uh, that will be great to hear. So we've experimented with uh, Anthropic and OpenAI and uh, MPT models. Uh, OpenAI is by far, uh, you know, the best for our use cases, which is we are trying to build a conversational UI layer, right? Where it's it's a it's a it's an interface stuff. So um, NL to configuration or like you know we you we want to use it in two ways. One is use this to uh, to decrease deployment times, which is configuring the system, et cetera, right? And uh, two is uh, directly act as a co-pilot for a finance person in their organization. For both of these cases, we found OpenAI to be useful. There's a security aspect that Akash has touched upon. Um, one way is uh, Azure allows you to um, host secure boxes. Azure OpenAI gives a little more security than OpenAI by itself gives. Both are equivalent in terms of functionality. So, but you need to be a slightly bigger company to force Microsoft to give you those stuff. <laughs> so I, I think it'll, 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 all I can say is that, you know, everybody needs to wait a little more uh, for things to be a little more democratized. Go ahead, Akash. Yeah, um, so, I guess pretty similar. So we use GPT-4 and 3. Uh, 4 is, so, uh, I mean, we used to use GPT-3 in the app uh, until we got access to 4, I think, a couple of months back. Since then, we have been using 4 in production. Um, but again, uh, it has its limitations, uh, particularly in terms of inference time span. And, like in terms of they have a cap limit, etc. So we also have sort of three in place as backup. Uh, we had also launched a free tool last week, coincidentally, which was uh, on product and which was built, which had sort of which used GPT three. Uh, now uh, 
we also sort of the Azure thing, I think I'll also double down. I think it will be a smart move for most companies are trying to sell to businesses to move to Azure as soon as they can. But again, it's not easy to do that. Uh, as for our stack, it's uh, pretty straightforward as of now. Uh, we have tried sort of Anthropic. I've also tried a bunch of other sort of layers that have, that are out there, kind of Langchain, Lama Index, a bunch of SaaS tools. But to be honest, we just did it all bare bones. Uh, we have uh, sort of a pipeline in place, uh, again, sort of basic pure Python and sort of a bunch of serverless functions in place. Um, and we sort of, because we are not hosting anything, we just are able to make to better typical cloud infrastructure. And we do a lot of, uh, and we have sort of a vector database in place. Uh, but again, it's pretty basic right now in terms of uh, the processing, et cetera, we do. Um, I'll, I'll just take over from what Akash did. You know, the, I think we are using fairly similar technologies, um, which is like we tried Langchain. Uh, it is just more, more hype than it is. Uh, what we pick up from Langchain is just basically, um, Langchain is just a collection of prompts. And these days it's almost like uh, most research papers are one prompt, right? So it's just a collection of these uh, research paper prompts, so to say. Uh, so you can use that. It's that for that it is very useful looking at Langchain. Uh, but otherwise all you need is just a, how you want your pipeline, how you want the output to, a be passed or looked at is like is in your hands. It's just a bunch of functions that you can write, right? So that we you do use. We've tried Pinecone, which is pretty good, um, but we have a uh, we have this security requirement. So we are using Quadrant um, as a vector database. Uh, so yeah, I mean we, basically we uh, Blue Copa hosts inside the customer choice uh, choice of cloud. So for that, we also host Quadrant inside that. Uh, it, it, it'll be, it, it is relatively okay. There is some backup stuff that you need to take care in terms of operations. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you're okay doing a vector database, which is hosted, it is better to do use a vector database, which is hosted. So personally, I'm a fan of don't do any undifferentiated heavy lifting. So don't, don't, don't bring operations for onto your uh, engineering team's head. So like as much as possible, like use the hosted ones. I'm sorry about that interruption, uh, but I'll quickly sum up so our stack again. Um, it's a, like we use OpenAI, uh, we use, we have an internal pipeline in place. What we have spent a lot of time on is, I think what Satya mentioned around grounding and sort of making sure uh, our sort of answers are truthful and sort of they have sort of high quality because our users do have a pretty high bar, uh, some of them in terms of even sort of things like summaries, et cetera. So we have spent a lot of time making sure that the output is same in a way. Uh, so things like uh, making sure prompts sort of are, uh, so yeah, basically tuning prompts or uh, around sort of validating the data that's being sort of, fit, uh, sort of received and sort of making sure that the data that moves from one stage to another that all that is um, sort of that makes sense but again all that happens with the typical sort of the existing cloud infrastructure that we have in place and all that and we haven't sort of relied on any sort of special tools as of now because as i mentioned they are not very uh, evolved like tried them but they are more of a overhead that help at this point one one small point i wanted to add was we did have these uh, we were always prompting it prompting uh the gpt4 api chat i think it's the chat gpt api so we were trying trying to prompt it to give back json in which there were functions that we could call etc right and now that is kind of almost irrelevant in the sense that you know openai does that if you just specify the functions in the functions um, section so it's like it's evolving, like I said, right? All we can do is wait and uh, it'll evolve to a uh, very decent extent. There's no point in hurrying into being, I don't know if you really get a first mover advantage in this. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a well, that's a good point. We're seeing it across the board, right? I think stability, quality, 
you know high value at the end of the day to the end user experience right is is where the differentiation will lie so it, just by being first nobody's it, it it's highly unlikely that yeah you can get somebody like open ai can get chat gpt and get 100 million users but apparently even that <clears throat> there were some tapering numbers over the last few yeah. weeks yeah. what i was hearing so you know maybe there's a novelty aspect there that everybody wanted to try hey let's see what how this answers let's see what responses we get but it's you know is it ingrained into everybody's workflow probably not and that that needs a lot of work right and if that needs a lot of work for chat gpt open ai that definitely needs a lot of work for everybody using <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense there there is one aspect of giving it out early which is that user familiarity and see i think user expectations are going to translate most people have tried gpt in our tech tech world and you know in the business world so they it's there is no resistance to trying and using it their their enthusiastic is what i understood so if you know it's just to meet that enthusiasm or to you know show that bar um, you know for investors <laughs> etc that you have to put out the open ai uh, the the chat interface but otherwise uh, um, yeah to really help customers I, I think there is a there there is still beta for some time it's going to stay yeah i think that barrier of hey how do you enable everybody to ask the right prompt put the right prompt ask the right question make it easier simpler 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 right that is where if friction is reduced then the consistent usage as well as the mass usage that is 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 most likely yeah and one other small aspect is we always almost for our use cases we put the temperature temperature to zero uh, so and it at least it gives predictable output almost all the time so we don't need it to be it is needed just one thing i'll add to that uh, especially because i think we have had a different route uh, compared to a lot of uh, people building with these uh, apis and sort of models uh, i think a lot of b2b and enterprise uh, there's a lot of ways of working that that are not changing anytime soon uh, at least not in the next couple of years so em- embedding into their workflow i think will be important especially for the b2b use case so a lot of this will be on ux and even if you think models uh, you have to think about where exactly does it fit into the workflow uh, uh, as like if you have to think beyond the chat interface or the search sort of in the case insights tanash ankita any other exciting questions that akash or satya can answer or we wrap with their predictions no well, i'm good to uh, move forward with the uh, their predictions also awesome. then their observation you know let's yeah. wrap with what do you guys think what are you most excited about what are amazing things that you think will we will see happen because of this you know like i said i'm just saying 5 years 10 years but you can pick a timeline just uh, prognosticate would love to hear your predictions or your wish list combination of those <clears throat> okay akash you want to go first so uh i think in the short term as is a short term which maybe five years uh, a lot of hopefully uh, there'll be more uh, sort of skilled people being able to do their work better uh, skilled as in knowledgeable people i think there are a lot of constraints right now which are you know redundant uh, be it in the business or creative sphere uh, like you have to do deal with a lot of overhead to get work done even if you know how to do it um that's where a lot of uh, kind of technical middlemen also come in i think that part hopefully will get reduced a bit and i know that is beating on my uh, sort of past job a bit but i think there's value to that uh, i think in and in addition there will hopefully be things which we haven't even thought about uh, so that i'm always sort of keeping my mind open for that another thing i'm generally really excited about which i'm not sure right now how that will take place is just for this to move out from the cyber sphere to just meet with the physical world 
I know a lot of this has been around LLMs and tech, uh, but in general, AI has uh, sort of been around in manufacturing and factory flows and all that a long time. Computer vision sort of developed a lot in those uh, sort of areas as well. So I'm generally curious and intrigued to see how this affects. Uh, I mean, agents is one way to do it, uh, but there may be sort of other ways to do it, how this basically permeates to the physical world. Um, that is another thing generally I'm looking forward to. Well, that's a very interesting, uh, the second one in terms of the physical world and hardware and how AI can power that in various use cases, right? We're already seeing that in biology as well, biotech, right? Uh, lots of exciting things there. Great point, great point. Satya? So, um, in the near term, what excites me is the fact that we can make digital twins of whole companies, including departments, organizations, everything, right? So almost that we might be able to make an autonomous uh, company. Right? So that's that's something, you know, that's the vision that Northstar that we'll operate with, right? Um, that's around a five to 10 year uh, time horizon, if you will, right? And uh, beyond that, it's, um, I know, I think it, it'll, technology is going to automate a lot of stuff, right? AI is going to automate our intelligence. So the human glue layer will not be there. So it might not be, there might, I, I'll just take the dark side of it, right? There might not be enough jobs, et cetera. The next generation might, people who are coming into work around 2030 would not, <laughs> would realistically find, you know, very tough things. Uh, all the people will say that you will always find a better thing to do. I don't know what that better thing this time is. So every time it is involved your brain, this time your brain is getting replaced. So I don't know what is that better thing that will come. That will come. Uh, so yeah, I am just looking forward to universal basic income, a post-commerce world, that sort of stuff. Right. So that's the 2040, 2050 horizon, if you will. No, very cool. Very cool. Obviously, a lot of positivity, a lot of interesting stuff, but also the, something to ponder upon. Yeah. I'm only, for the short term, happy that neither of you said that the VC job is at stake. <laughs> Maybe it is, <laughs> but amazing. Yeah. In, in, in finance, right? The way we think about it is uh, finance people only trust humans, at least as of now. Right, so I think people will trust VCs with their money. So the, maybe a little longer. Maybe we between, have it. Maybe yeah. we are safer for a little longer. <laughs> so as, a, as a conduit for people who have money and people who need money, I think that will stay. Uh, no, amazing, amazing way to end this. Thanks so much, both of you. Real freewheeling conversation. Learned a lot on so many aspects. You know, we made guesses on a few things. Right, we understood where this is going. One of the overarching messages I'm taking away and for the audience is probably, hey, let's be patient, build right, get it right, focus on the use case, right? The buzz is there, the hype is there, but you know there ne isn't necessarily a first mover advantage. Do what is most important for the end use case and the end user, right? Using all these tools, all right? And uh, yeah, I think that's where the value lies. Super, super exciting conversation, guys, and super exciting what both of you are building, right? Akash, Luke Panel, Satya, Blue Copa, right? We are, of course, biased and insiders, but we are very excited to have you go and leverage these technologies to add more value to these businesses, right? And look forward to more and more such conversations. Thank you so much, everyone. Signing off from Speciale Talks in this edition. Really appreciate the time. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.